Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from our reading out of Acts. I read again verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. In baseball, it is always important to keep your eye on the ball. When the pitcher throws the ball at the batter and he can't keep his eye on the ball, he's going to strike out every time. If you are out in the field and the ball is coming at you and you can't keep your eye on the ball, you're not going to catch the ball or field the ball. You're going to drop it and bobble it every time. And if you're a catcher behind home plate and you don't keep your eye on the ball, well, you're going to be one lousy catcher, aren't you? Of course, the same is true in football. Let us just say that your job is to rush the passer. You want to get that sack, right? But if you don't keep your eye on the ball, what happens when the quarterback hands the football off to a running back? You're still running after that quarterback, and the running back is running down the field. Or you're a receiver, and you can't keep your eye on the football. Well, if the defender keeps his eye on the ball, what happens? A lot of interceptions. If you don't keep your eye on the ball, you have problems. Same is true for basketball. You shoot, uh, you pass the ball, and if the guy's not looking, bounces off the back of their head, big problem. Okay, you have to change the metaphor a little bit for hockey. You got to keep your <coughs> eye on the puck. But in the end, it's the same sort of thing. So the phrase, keeping your eye on the ball, is very appropriate for sports, but it has transferred over into regular life, hasn't it? Keeping your eye on the ball becomes a metaphor for keeping the main things the main things. Do not get distracted. If you do, you might actually drop the ball. In the old prayer that uh, we use in our communion services, and we'll be using a little bit later in this service, the ball for us is described as faith toward God and fervent love toward all people. In our mission statement that we have in our constitution, the ball is described as strengthening ourselves spiritually in order to bring all people into harmony with God and his son, Jesus Christ. That strengthen ourself part is the faith in God part of the old prayer, and the bringing all people into harmony with God and his son is the fervent love towards all people part of that same prayer. That is what we say the ball is for us at our Redeemer. As we look at our reading in Acts today, we see that our ball is a good description of the life of the apostolic church. The believers strengthen the, themselves by devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. In verse 47, we hear about the bringing all people into harmony with God and his son, with the word, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. While during the Easter season, our Old Testament lesson is substituted with a reading from Acts, nonetheless, it should come as no surprise that in the Old Testament, we have the same ball described, the ball of having faith in God and love for one another. Perhaps the uh, easiest Old Testament uh, lesson to bring out that first part, uh, faith in God, would be the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. 
and we all remember how Luther uh, explained that in the small catechism, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Faith in God. As far as bringing all people into harmony with God and his son, Jesus Christ, certainly all those passages that speak about Abraham and his descendants, especially his great descendant, Jesus, as being a blessing to all nations, come quickly to mind. Psalm 22 describes this blessing which is brought about by the atoning death of that great descendant, Jesus. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. It should come as no surprise then that this dual thrust, faith in God and love for our neighbor, has been a hallmark of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, from the very beginning. We are known as a confessional denomination. That means that we know what we believe and we stick by it. From the very beginning, this has been a very distinctive feature of who we are. The founding churches first wanted to be sure that they were in agreement in their understanding of the gospel. This was no group of churches that wanted union simply for the sake of union, to simply say, well, we're a bigger church now than we were 24 hours ago. They deliberately sought to stand on the Bible as understood in the Lutheran confessions. What is often overlooked is that these believers also had a passion for the lost. While all agree that the denomination experienced uh, extraordinary, even exponential growth for its first century, I'm often surprised to read history books that downplay this. They seem to think that our growth was simply through making babies and adding Lutheran immigrants who were excitedly looking for a faithful Lutheran church. The writers often overlook that many Germans left the German land expressly to get away from the church. Their experience with the state church was unpleasant, and they transferred that experience, that dislike, to all churches, and even to Jesus and God. You may not know this, but in 1875, half of the newspapers in St. Louis were German. How many people knew that? I'm just curious. A few did. There were a lot of newspapers. Half of them were written in German. That's how many German people were there. Or to put a number to that, 50 daily or weekly newspapers came out in German. Half of those were vehemently anti-church. These people were not looking for a new church, let alone a Lutheran church. They were happy that they had escaped the state church, and they were not trying to find another one. But as I said, the founders of the Missouri Senate had a passion for the lost. And that is why these passionately anti-church, anti-Jesus, anti-God people came to faith and joined the Missouri Senate. Our first president, C.F.W. Author, whose commemoration, as we mentioned earlier, happens to be today, and this is why I'm sort of talking about the Missouri Senate a bit, expressed this passion when he addressed the denomination in convention. This is what our first president said. What would happen if we really would make the saving of souls the ultimate purpose, the end and aim of our joint work? What an influence it would be on our dear congregations and their pastors and on their relationship toward one another if all acknowledged that saving of souls is our end and aim of our joint work. They will all pull as peacefully as they do zealously on the same yoke. Even though all kinds of strife-causing questions might arise, Yet the question, what course is best for the salvation of souls, 
will quickly give the right solution. Then our dear congregations will say to one another, as Abraham said to Lot, let there not be strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. Whatever will win the most souls for Christ, that would decide between us. I can tell you something for sure. A man who makes reaching the unsaved with the gospel the main question that we should ask ourselves when deciding our course of action is a person with a passion for the unchurched. He was a man who wanted to keep the, his eye on the ball. Certainly, as we speak about this, we would remember the Great Commission. And you'd probably think I was weird if I didn't get around to mentioning that passage at some point in this message. There Jesus instructs us to make disciples of all nations, which is the bringing all people into harmony with God and his son, part of our mission statement. We do this by baptizing and teaching, which is the strengthening ourselves part of our mission statement. What we have been considering actually can be summed up with one simple word. And if you remember no other word out of this sermon, this is the word to remember. Why? Why are we here? Why do we do the things we do? Churches do many different things. Okay, how many people have been to a church that does something different than we do? Show of hands, huh? Yeah, of course. Okay, the question isn't do churches do things differently? Of course they do. The question, though, should be why? Why should The why should always be the same no matter what a church does. To use the answer Luther gave, the why is to win souls for Christ. That, of course, means here in Newark and surrounding areas. But it is never intended to be limited to Newark. Through things like our internet presence, we reach out with a life-giving gospel well beyond our community. We reach out through the district and senate as well. We reach out through other agencies like Lutheran World Relief or Orphan Grain Train and the like. St. Paul described this to the Galatians when he wrote, so then as we have opportunity let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. When we gather for worship, we need to be sure that we lift high the cross. Why? Because it is the life-giving word of the cross that brings people saving faith and strengthens them in that same faith. When we publish our newsletter, we need to ask ourselves, how does this promote salvation by grace through faith in Jesus? Why? Because that is what we are about. When we gather for a picnic, when we have Bible studies, when we participate in activities such as Lutheran Church Charities or Lutheran Women's Missionary League, we again look at them as a way to share the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we think deeply about this, we realize that gospel, the gospel is also how we are strengthened ourselves. Anytime we keep our focus on Jesus and his love, we are brought closer in our bond with both God and each other. Each time we take our focus off of Jesus, all sorts of things can disturb our fellowship can disturb our peace. I'm not saying that such a focus will make all difficulties disappear. We are, after all, still sinners, right? But I'm saying that our mutual purpose of sharing God's love with each other and those beyond will be our why. That why will shape 
our lives and our church. We will then find the words of God in 1 Peter true. Above all, keep your love for one another fervent because love covers a multitude of sins. So, to bring this back full circle, we are to keep our eyes on the ball, the ball of God's love in Christ Jesus for us and for all people, the ball of sharing the gospel with each other, the ball of strengthening ourselves with the gospel and bringing all people into harmony with God and his Son. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.